Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to our Esper and Creating Collaborative School Relationships Workshop. I'm proud to be and pleased to be the moderator for th this session. I'm Tracy Newman, the project coordinator at CSHA. Um, and before I introduce you to our presenter, I want to make sure we do a couple of housekeeping and also like give you some reminders. But uh, we have our chat icon as well as our Q&A icon in the top right hand corner. Um, so if you can, we would love it if you can engage in the chat, you know, good morning, everyone, you know, let us know who you are, where you're from, you know, what you hope to get out of the session, things like that. And we'll have other questions and like discussion points that we'd love it if you can participate in the chat with as well. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to put them in the chat box or the Q&A box, and then we'll get to them um, at the end of our workshop. But that said, I also want to mention that we will be putting a survey link into the chat um, in a bit, as well as before the session ends. And hopefully, uh, we'd love it if you guys could take your time to fill out those survey, and that will give you 50 gamifi gamification points uh, mm -hmm. so that you have chances to um, be part of the raffle, to submit to be part of the raffle. And we have some really cool prizes as well for the last day. So please fill out the survey. And if you did not fill out the um, survey for day one of conference or day two of conference, you can still fill them out now. So please make sure you do that and you'll still get the points um, for the raffle as well. But I will put that in the chat in a bit. But otherwise than that, please engage in the chat and we're happy to have you here. And I'll go ahead and pass it on to Allison, our presenter for today. Hi, thanks, Tracy. Um, my name is Allison Kilcoin. I am the vice president of the um, of integration, wellness, and community development for North Shore Community Health, uh, and that is a federally qualified health center north of Boston. So yes, I am coming um, to you today uh, from Massachusetts. I'm also the president of the Massachusetts School-Based Health Alliance, uh, and I've served on the board of directors for the National School-Based Health Alliance. Um, School-Based Health is in my DNA. It is the love of everything that I do. Um, and I think the perfect way to serve um, youth. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. And we can get started. Okay. And Tracy, you just let me know if there's any problems. Um, you can private chat me for any problems with my slides. So screening brief intervention, referral to treatment, creating collaborative school relationships. I have nothing to disclose. Um, and just to remind you what you signed up for or uh, what you think you signed up for is really looking at expert uh, at a school-based health center, we really need to look at collaborative relationships and how we engage school and community personnel um, in, in getting this important work done. And so really what we're focusing on in this workshop is the art really of building those collaborative relationships and building trust. And so we're going to talk about ways to engage school and community personnel in championing not only school-based health care, but also ESPERT. Um, identify ways um, to build some trust with stakeholders. We're going to dive into a little bit of, of theory around what trust is and, and look at some definitions. And then I'm going to present to you a real live case study on um, co-creating um, a collaborative school health center program uh, and some bumps in the road and what um, I personally uh, learn from it along the way. And just to level set a moment about ESPERT. Um, and so as we know, it ESPERT's a comprehensive integrated public health approach um, to the delivery of early intervention and treatment services for persons with substance use disorders. Um, really using in primary care centers, hospital emergency rooms, trauma centers. The screening quickly assesses um, and is very evidence-based and shown in literature um, to prevent severe substance use um, in, with uh, creating some level of uh, intervention and treatment. We use motivational interviewing in order to focus on behaviors. Um, and then that referral to treatment just provides provides those individuals that need a little more care than we can do in some um, brief interventions in, in a primary care or school-based health setting. 
And so what are my assumptions um, for people in this virtual room? Uh, my assumptions really are that you have some understanding um, and some competency around experts. So um, not that I like to say what this, um, what this presentation is not, but this presentation is not around how to do SBIRT. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that there is some understanding in that. I'm assuming that you're here at the California School Based Health Alliance conference and that you believe in the school based health center model of care. I, I'm assuming that working at the inter that you believe also that working at the intersection of healthcare and education is full of opportunities and also full of challenges. And and really the true the truth of the last point is that humans are complicated. And um, moving forward with the assumption that we can have processes um, and have perfect processes and workflows, um, but it's the humans um, that are behind the processes and the workflows that can be really complicated. And that is what you know I'd like to share with you about just different ways to develop those relationships in order to get the work move the work forward. So yes, I'm coming to you from Massachusetts. Um, it is a cold but sunny day um, today in Massachusetts. Um, but in, in Massachusetts, uh, school-based health centers have really been using SBIRT, um, specifically the craft tool, since 2005-06 uh, when we beta tested it um, for the researchers at Boston Children's Hospital. I was actually working as a nurse practitioner in a school-based health center at the time and went through lots of training. Uh, I see the value, um, really firsthand value of of SBIRT and how it can make an impact um, on, on just um, kids' lives and, and, and opening up conversations. Um, so I really believe um, in, in the tool. And in, Ma in March of 2016, our legislature here passed law that requires public schools in the Commonwealth to engage in substance use screening and education. And so what that looks like is each district has to choose one grade in uh, middle school and one grade in high school and screen the entire population um, with SBIRT. So uh, since then, um, there's most um, all school districts have been trained in how to do the SBIRT. Um, most school districts have partnered with a school based health center if they have one on on how to um, to implement this, but this is really looking at population health and um, and data is forthcoming. I haven't seen any um, yet. And this is a, a slide that I, I also like to level set on what makes school-based health centers successful, which all of you may know. Uh, and this is from the National School-Based Health Alliance. And when we look at our, our services and, and, and our programs of school-based health, really what makes a school-based health center successful are these three cogs in the wheel, um, strong partnerships, a sound business model, and high quality practice. And where SBIRT is evidence-based, high quality, screening. Um, what we're going to focus on today are your strong partnerships and specifically partnerships um, within the school in order to deliver this um, service. I don't know if any of you have um, read or watched Simon Sinek's um, TED Talk. I, I do think it's worth 18 minutes of your life um, around starting with the why, not with the what. And I found that this work really resonates with me because what we usually do is we start from the outside in. We say the what, right? We want a school-based health center. Um, how? We're going to build it. We're going to create construction. Uh, we're going to get all of the people set. We're going to hire people. We're going to find funding. And then we think about the purpose uh, after the fact. And what I put to you is what really is transforming in building relationships is really starting with the why. And so the why of school-based health centers. And I've, I've spent a lot of time personally cultivating what my why is. Like, why do I believe um, in school-based health centers? And I've gotten it down um, to a couple sentences, which I'm going to share with you. 
is because I really believe that youth deserve access to all of the services they need in order to thrive and that school-based health centers create that access in a high quality, efficient, safe, and youth focused way. And so that's been a while for me to kind of cultivate getting that um, into a, a succinct sentence. And I'd like to ask you, and Tracy's going to help me to take a moment, take a breath, and maybe think about what your why for school-based health centers are and write it in the chat. And then so that I can hear them, um, Tracy will read them out to me. But you can take a minute or two. So we have our first response and Sierra said, because they bring health to where young people are and help them make informed, empowered decisions about their health. Mm. I like that informed, empowered decisions about their health. That's great. I may, you know, take some of these and, and rework my sentence someday too. So I need your help. I think we can give folks like another two or three minutes for them to think about it and time. Sure. We just have one came come in from Chelsea. Um, they say it's my passion that the community and healthcare systems need to uplift and support our youth in a holistic way. Mm -hmm. SBHCs to me help coordinate services to meet the needs of youth where they are. Mm. Uplift. I like that word too. I'm going to start writing them down. That's great. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on. And so if we think about SBIRT, right, and we think about the why of SBIRT, um, because what usually happens and what I've seen happen is the it's the what. Right. We need to screen people. We need to screen youth um, because Massachusetts says it's now the law. How are we going to do it? Well, we're going to train all of the guidance counselors and then we're going to take everybody out of English class and we're going to file them to the gym and they're going to sit and, and we're going to get that process down. And that we didn't think about the why before. And so what happened with that is we had a lot of pushback from the guidance counselors in, in one of the schools that I was in. And that's when I was asked to kind of come in and meet with guidance counselors to, to talk about the SBIRT. And, and the goal was, according to the school administration, was for me to teach them about SBIRT. But where I started was with the why, because it we can teach them the skills and we can teach them the how, but if we didn't have buy-in around the why, screening three or 400 kids in three days with SBIRT, um, there wasn't a lot of buy-in for that. So when I said why, that I believe that the earlier we start and we open the conversations about substance use with the youth, substance use with youth, the sooner we can help them access the education and the support they need to make those choices around substance use, right? And so once we started having those conversations, um, we could we could move the how forward. So again, I'm going to ask you to think about what you know about SBIRT um, and what is your why you know why is expert of value or why 
would you want to push this, move this forward or implement this in your school-based health center? So we have a response come in and the person said, I think it helps catch young people early that might not know that they have an issue with substances and then we can get them connected to the help and or resources they need sooner. Excellent. Yeah, it is those connections, right? Like um, being able to identify that in that conversation and then make those connections. And maybe that's the connection with the person administering the test, right? The, the screening tool. Thank you. <laughs> we'll give you another another minute or so. Another response just came in and it says connecting with and educating youth about substance use early in their development can help give them the capacity to know how to identify and improve their situations in the future. Mm, excellent. That's great. Because one of the pushbacks I've gotten in in doing this work from um, uh, from from school personnel sometimes is that, you know, I, I don't want to ask because I don't want to know because then I don't know what to do, right? And so really talking um, to people as a first point, like this is the reason is to start to have the conversation and maybe the conversation doesn't happen now, but maybe that youth knows that they can come back and you're a safe person to talk to later or the next day or at another time and that's the beauty i think of school-based health centers um, is that we're there and we're present in their spaces and so we create that safety um, to be able to circle back um, and serve the youth anything else tracy um no not nothing oh. in the chat for now okay so we'll move on so then what we do is we collaborate on the how. So we start with the, the why. We get buy-in on the why. Everybody has a shared understanding as to why we are doing this. And then we collaborate on the how. And I and I can't, um, you know, we'll talk about it in, in my, in my uh, case study in a little bit. Uh, communication, communication, communication. Um, in any form, all forms, in person, over Zoom, in emails, uh, in uh, any way that you can communicate, I, I feel like it, it is it is not um, wasted time um, communicating on like how are we going to do this. Find the people with the shared values. They are there. They're there. They're in the buildings that you're in. They're in the districts that, that they're in. We just have to um, sometimes find them. Um, and what are your values? So some of my values around this work is equity, collaboration, and flexibility. And so finding those people that have those shared values through making those relationships. And they may not be who you think they should be. You may think they should be um, 
a building principal, or you may think that they should be the superintendent, but really who it is is the health teacher or really the school nurse, or um, or maybe it's a parent that's really active in the theater program. And so finding um, the, the people that um, can share the work with you. And then figuring out the how. Do you convene a work group? Do you join an existing group to look talk about the how? Do you offer some service or expertise? How can I help you? Um, how can we help you? And really know that that when you're working with schools, I, and you've heard it before, you've seen one school-based health center, you've seen one school-based health center, um, that we are there in collaboration. We show up in collaboration for the shared uh, purpose of caring for the youth. And, and we're not solving the problems for the school, but we're listening intently, we're taking notes, we're circling back, we're following up. And sometimes in, in the rush to want to get things done, um, we, we think we have not achieved because it's not done. And this is something that we don't just want to get done, but we want to get done right. And we want it um, to be together. It really is a long-term relationship with all of these players. And so whenever we talk about building relationships, trust, um, is is really paramount and i like this definition by charles feltman is trust is choosing to risk so, so making something you value vulnerable to another person's actions um charles feltman has done some work he is an organizational psychologist and looking about looking around trust and what builds trust and and so i sometimes like to go back to his work and this thin book of trust is 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 an, it's a good short read on, on what it is that makes trust. It's basically things that maybe you innately would know. Um, you're sincere, you're of sincerity. You say what you mean and you mean what you say. Um, and um, you're believed and you're taken seriously. Like you're sincere um, with your offers and your ask. You're reliable, right? You make commit, you meet the commitments you make. Um, I think about you know, if you, that you show up on time to meetings, that's one of my elements of trust personally for me, that people are on time because my time is valuable um, and their time is valuable. That you have some competence, competency, and you have the ability to do what you say that, that you're going to do. Um, I am a big believer in school-based health um, and I can work uh, on expert and evaluating students, um, but I'm not a behavioral health provider, so I can't provide therapy. I can't, I'm a nurse practitioner by trade. So I, I can do certain amounts, but then I'm clear with what I actually can't do and when I need to bring in partners. And care. Do you have the other person's interests in mind when you make the decisions and take these actions? Again, I think that ties nicely back to the why. You know, the why around the implementing you know, um, population health screening in Massachusetts for Espert, you know, is about addressing the crisis of substance use disorders and really the opioid crisis that we've had in the state. Um, it is it is not about getting it done because it's a law and a regulation. And sometimes um, that gets uh, a little bit messy, and we have to go back to mission, vision, values, and the why. And so developing, again, that trusting relationship, um, again, if if I'm a big Brene Brown fan, I know she is, she's pretty much in the vernacular in, in our culture, but I really like how she identifies um, how you build trust is by this braving, right, this acronym, boundary, boundaries, reliability, accountability, the vault, integrity, non-judgment, and generosity, um, you know, I won't go too deeply into all of these, except to say that boundaries are really important, specifically with youth, as anyone who works uh, with youth know, and specifically with schools, right? Like being really clear what our purpose is um, and 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 what our limits are um, and and what is what's okay and what's not okay. Um, because that sets up your reliability. So then you can be reliable and accountable to what you say you, you were going to do. Um, and so I also really believe um, 
in that trust is built in very small moments. And, and that really is doing what you say um, and saying what you do. Like you could, um, you know, help out, I don't know, principal, because he says, can you reach out to this student that I'm worried about that's struggling? And you say, yes. And then you, we get busy in our day and we don't. And then we don't circle back and tell them, I'm sorry, I didn't have enough time. We just kind of let that fly, which I mean, I've been subject to do that myself. But that just erodes trust a little bit. And so be careful. That's why boundaries are important. Set your boundaries and be reliable to do what you say and accountable. Um, and I think that that goes a long way. Um, saying no sometimes is just as important as saying yes. And as a carer, I sometimes get, get caught in wanting to say yes all the time. So then after the, the, the why and the how, and then you move to the what. And so what is the what? I don't know because you've developed you've developed that from the why and the how. So maybe it is development and implementation of an expert screening program in the school or in the school-based health center, or, or negotiating um, how students are going to access the health center for screening and follow-up appointments. You know, this is a I think a big one in school-based health where, at times, schools really want the care. Um, to be given to our youth, but they also have a concern about out of seat time. And so really talking about, we have the shared value to X, Y, Z, and part of these what's will also get us to that X, Y, Z. Maybe, you know, conflicts come up. Conflicts, I, I shouldn't say maybe, I should say conflicts will um, arise. And, and what has helped me is being very clear on what my values are and looking at the conflict as a conflict in values, not in persons um, and not in, well, people don't care about this youth. No, I think it's really about what are our priorities and our values and how do we come to a shared understanding and really focusing on, on that why. And so, I'm going to share with you uh, a case study, and this is a real life case study um, about a diversion to suspension program. And I've learned a lot by making many mistakes, um, by being asked to do something, by not having a real deep understanding. So I'm going to share this with you. And um, and I'd love to at some point like listen to any type of feedback or thoughts uh, and questions. And you can put them in the chat. Tracy will hold on to them and then um, we'll, we'll talk about them after. So here's the, here's the story. I was um, a director of school-based health program and in May 2016, the superintendent called and said, we're having a substance use disorder problem in our schools. I really, he had had some personal loss and trauma around substance use disorders in his family. And he said, I would like um, a spe specialist substance use disorder behavioral health provider to lead a diversion to suspension program at the high school. So, my agency, North Shore Community Health, that's the um, sponsoring agency at the school, hired an LICSW, um, licensed independent um, clinical social worker here in Massachusetts. Um, and we presented a pilot program to replicate from another school district that she had worked in. Everybody was real happy. And so the criteria for this this program um, that we were replicating was that any student caught intoxicated or in possession of substances or paraphernalia will be diverted to this program. Of course, not at the time of intoxication, but again, the diversion piece of suspension, our understanding of diversion to suspension is you don't get suspended, you come to um, this program, you have some screen, you're, you have an expert screening, you meet a few sessions with a social worker, you get some education, and, um, and then move from there. So we uh, worked together, we developed referral forms, we sent them to the deans of the students, um, there were three, and then two other administrators, um, with requirements of what the referral like should look like, the parent information sheets, the, the, 
consent forms, the guidelines, the workflows for the program that we had built out. And in that school year, we had under five referrals. I think five is stretching it. Um, and students were basically, they went to out of school suspension. And if you think about looking at this, it sounds like a great program, right? It sounds like, wow, we're offering this, this service to these high-risk students that can, you know, they make a mistake, they get caught, they can get some education and then they can move on. And I think if you've been listening, what happened is, you know, how I described this is that the school-based health center did this program. We were asked by the superintendent remember that's not anybody that was in the school um, and then we developed this program and we tried to administer the program and so then the next school year came we continued to educate and do outreach and um, that year we had no referrals but we had some we had behavioral health referrals for for kids that were struggling or depressed or needed some support there but we didn't have any re referrals to this program so 2018 and 19, we just stopped the program indefinitely because we um, we couldn't we didn't have a shared understanding that this was a diversion to suspension program, not um, a, a a punishment around using drugs and alcohol, and so we stopped. And then in the fall 2019, if we can remember back to then. We had this vaping crisis. Um, kids were getting caught vaping all the time on school property, during class. It was the 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 administrators were just running um, and catching kids, and that was and they didn't know what to do. And they came to us and said, "Can you help us? We don't know what to do." And so within a month, we co-created and launched a diversion pro program for vaping nicotine. It started as nicotine um, and then moved into also marijuana. Um, but we all sat down at the table. We got a shared understanding of what it is we were trying to accomplish. We were partnering um, with uh, the school personnel that wanted partners and wanted help. Um, and we had to do some, you know, focusing on the why and then how we were going to do this. And then we came up with the what. And so between October 2019 and March 2020, we all know what happened after March 2020, um, we had 34 referrals um, to this diversion program. Um, 15 of those were for vaping THC. Um, and then um, 10 of those actually ended up being referred to um, uh, nicotine replacement therapy by our um, nurse practitioners. Um, and so we developed this um, this program. And if you you can read in here that it students had to attend these groups. Um, the first intake was a expert intake with the, the nurse practitioner. Then they had four sessions of groups. And then um, they had a certain amount of days. They had 25 days to complete this and go back um, to the um, their administrator. And then um, they didn't have to serve any um, suspension. And so this was in lieu of suspension. Um, and it worked out. It, it, it was the, the lesson was that you can have great ideas uh, and want to really push something forward and really believe in something, but, but sometimes it doesn't work on the timeline that you want it to. And so now um, this is our standard um, of practice at this school-based health center. And um, we are using the, the diversion program uh, for, a ho for all substance use disorders as we, substance use infringements as we wanted to prior. And so I really think implementing these programs is about leadership and it's about people and relationships um, and not about plans. I think as a nurse practitioner, you know, I'm used to writing prescriptions and I'm used to doing treatment plans, but it really is about the human motivation, the human connections that motivate people um, to do things, to collaborate, to get things done, um, and really being people-centered. I wanted to put this quote up by Colin Powell. 
So I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, in a moment because I would like to answer any questions, take any comments. Um, I, I love learning from presentations as well. Um, so I, I welcome any feedback. Um, and that is my email. I also welcome feedback in emails. Um, maybe you think of something tomorrow or the next day. So I'm going to stop sharing and see if I can find you. OK. Tracy, did I do that right? Am I back? <laughs> yes, you are back. OK. Just waiting for folks to put any questions they may have in the chat box or in the Q&A tab. Either is fine. We look forward to your questions. So we have a question from Chelsea in the Q&A tab. I can read it to you, Allison. She says, um, any recommendations on school relationship building um, as we explore telehealth for our SBHCs? Mm -hmm. Telehealth. Yeah. Um, well, I think, again, it's starting with the why, right? And so if, if your why around telehealth is, you know, students need to access um, the service like the services in any way that they can and this is just another strategy I think that that's that's useful I, I do we haven't had a problem um, in our school-based health centers with youth um, accessing during telehealth appointments during the school day and finding a safe um, comfortable place in the high school mostly in the high school um, yet. Uh, so I think that there's a heightened awareness of how there's a lack of resources for support and there's a high need. Um, and so I would, I would have that conversation um, kind of start there um, and offer telehealth as just another strategy um, to bring the services in an equitable way to the student population. Not sure if that answers your question. Thank you for your answer, Allison. We have another question. Um, this one asks, what does the diversion program entails? So, um, so the diversion program that we have at our school, um, it basically is um, students have some type of rules infraction right and you around using or possessing drugs alcohol or paraphernalia and um that would usually get them either an in-school suspension or an out-of-school suspension and so the what we don't do is discipline and I, I would say that the most important thing to remember in any implementing any diversion program is if you are not a school employee that is supposed to do, to do um, discipline, we don't do discipline, we do care, treatment, education. And so that is where we began the why, is that youth needed some education about the risks that they were taking around drugs and alcohol, vaping, nicotine. Um, and so we were the experts in the school for that. And so that's where we decided it is the dean or the administrators. It was their decision as to whether or not to offer um, the diversion program. And so sometimes First, definitely first offenses, they would offer this. Um, you know, mo most of the time, if they were multiple offenses, those children may already have been in treatment. And then that's a conversation um, with the parent, um, the treatment provider, and the school. So 
the thought is, you know, this, that kids don't learn by being punished. If there isn't, if there isn't, if we're just sending kids using drugs and alcohol home, and we're not teaching them skills and strategies in order to really look at their use, their patterns, their why are they using, or how are they coping, or there could there be other things that they're doing, um, we're not helping them. We're not teaching them. Uh, we're not helping them learn. Um, and that's our whole goal of school-based health is to have youth that are thriving and accessing their education and learning. And so um, that's really the, the heart of it. Um, the what, the actual doing the what sometimes gets messy. Kids will say, yeah, I'll go to the diversion program. And then they don't show up. Um, and, you know, we do the three, you know, three times we'll call you, but we put the ownership on the student to come down to the health center to make the appointment. They have a paper. Um, and if they don't, that's their consequence. We don't chase them. Right. So they'll, they're given a, a, a list of an appointments. They have their cards. They put it in their phone. Um, their um, their dean of students knows that when their appointments are and then we leave it to the student to take to you know have that sense of agency and show up um and then we don't you know we don't have judgment uh as to whether they do or they don't they are accountable to um the administrators for that we will always take them in any capacity for education and training and education in on expert or doing expert or any type of supports they need um, but I tend to stay far away from the discipline um, piece. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for your detailed answer. That was great. Um, we don't have any questions for now, but I want to give folks another two or three minutes to, you know, think of questions, process all that information. And as I say that, we have another question, which is go. super great. Um, the question is, do you have any recommendations for SBHCs on the referral treatment, referral to treatment part mm. of Esper? That's such a hard question, a great question and a hard question because it's, you know, we can do the SBI. It's the RT that's really hard to find sometimes. Um, and, and, you know, being from Massachusetts, where, you know, I'm in the greater Boston area, we, ha we have the highest density of um, child and adolescent psychiatrists in the country, and we still can't find, we still can't get kids um, appointments. And so, and there, I think in the state of Massachusetts, we have two um, inpatient um, uh, substance use disorder treatment programs, and then I think we have two or th maybe three um, intensive outpatient programs that are specialized in um, substance use disorders. So care is real, it's really hard. Um, I think that's why early intervention is best. Hoping that people, that youth aren't, aren't in so much into their, um, into a use and that it's really um, disturbing their functioning and that they they need a higher level of care. Um, in Massachusetts, we also have recovery high schools. And so um, when student, when youth do get into a type of detox or a, an inpatient or an intensive outpatient program, they can actually go to, a, um, it's like a therapeutic high school for, for youth that are in recovery. Um, again, there's about five of them across, um, across the state. It's a challenge. And I think that, um, I don't have any answers uh, other than, um, you know, we do what we can do in school-based health centers, but we also have to be clear to, to teachers, to educators, and to families that we are not um, an intensive outpatient program unless we have that in school-based health centers, which I've thought about um, doing. Um, so it, it, is, it is hard. I, I wouldn't want that, though, to take away from the needing to screen and do the S, the S, B, and the I, because I do feel like that motivational interviewing and that relationship that you can build um, in those small brief interventions can really motivate youth to make different decisions. Um, 
it, it really it really can so i wouldn't want that to to dishearten those that don't want to do it the referral to treatment is difficult i will i will agree i don't have the answers i wish i did if anybody does please please post it in the chat thank you and the concern behind that that i did not read earlier but it was just saying sometimes finding youth-friendly SUD treatment centers can be hard and, you know, we just want to make sure we don't lose youth in the process. So that was the mm -hmm. concern behind that question. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have another question. Um, person is asking, can you touch a little bit more on relationship building with the families of the youth? Mm. Yeah. That is, I have to say, for the youth that I serve, that I've I've worked with, has been the biggest challenge. From a couple of standpoints, I think, um, um, from their work, because a lot of the the families that I um, youth that I serve have um, they have jobs during the day and they can't take a phone call during the hours that you know the school based health center is open. Um, I. I think community health workers are essential. Um, people that are of the community, that know the community, that can be that family partner and that link back to the school-based health center is vital. And we are going to be um, piloting that uh, in a, in a, we received a grant from HRSA to look at um, enhancing uh, telehealth services in our school-based health centers. Um, but usually using a, a community health a community health worker model where that person works the off hours and is present at like either pickup or drop off of schools or uh, after schools or dinner to hours and goes to community events and starts to build those relationships because where our value and really our strength has been being able to have access in school-based health centers for kids so that parents don't need to leave work right and that they can continue their work and they won't lose their job or um, or have not get paid for be having to come and get their child um, the flip side of that when you turn it on its head is that we're there when the parents aren't there and so making those connections um, is really important so i think thinking outside the box and it's almost like school-based health centers outside of the school-based health center um, Thank you for that. We have another, actually, is that a question? Let me see this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a question, but it's a comment, you know, really um, great to hear what you've been saying and, you know, try to do what we can do to make a difference, really. And I think that's really like mm -hmm. the whole point of like, you know, attending these workshops and gleaning what we can from it and really applying what we've learned. Um, but if we have any other questions, please um, go ahead and put it in the Q&A tab or in the chat box. We have another question. Awesome. Please mm -hmm. keep the questions rolling keep in. Keep them coming. <laughs> have you ever worked with a school that wasn't on board with a diversion program? And do you have any tips on how to help move them towards alternatives mm -hmm. to suspension? Yes, the this, this, this school that I wanted to, that we started, they were not interested uh, in it. And, you know, I think it's a and it was just a practice of continuing to ask, what is it? What was the goal? What do they need? Um, how can we help? How can we serve? Where are our expertise? And, you know, you know, having a shared understanding as to what is the best for the, the student in front of them. And, and really, um, if, a, if, a, if a school does not want a diversion program, they won't get a diversion program it's a cultural thing it's a belief system and believing in restorative justice and believing that kids are not just what they do and that their behavior is telling you that something else is going on and so i we just keep having those conversations um you know when you hear in the hallway your teacher says to you oh that kid you know they're in the fight club i've heard that one they're in the girls fight club you know well, she's a lost cause. It's like, oh, okay, like, so I would say, huh, you know, to me, 
a girl, you know, getting in fights a lot during school is telling me that something else is going on. I wonder, I wonder what's behind the behavior. So the more we start having those conversations and we start paying attention to when people, um, again, trust is built in small moments. And I think minds are changed in small moments, right? So how do we model that behavior with the, the the youth that we serve as they come in but also with the the school communities that we serve um i i think it's um the the it's almost like motivational interviewing your school personnel and you know to get them to the places like oh what's working for you right uh, and what happened for us is that they couldn't manage the discipline anymore they couldn't, they could not manage all of the kids vaping in all of the bathrooms all of the time, um, showing up to class high, vaping in the, in the, um, in the school classrooms, and they needed help. And so what the diversion program did is at least take some of it off of their plate, right? That they, you know, um, and you kind of start small and, you know, shifting mindset is, a long process is why one of the slides I said it's it's a long-term relationship um, and so paying deep attention to comments and questions that you're asked and what you're asked to do um, and modeling the behavior and the beliefs in your interactions I think has the most impact you don't see it right away thank you for that um, while we wait for more Q&As, if there's any more that I want to highlight for a moment, um, our survey that I put in the chat already, it's um, in the link uh, for you. So if you can, please make sure you take that survey. It's a way for us as CSHA know on what to improve, you know, and things like that. And also it gives you gamification points and that goes towards you um, submitting for chances to win the raffle again. But um, please make sure you do that. And then let's see. We have like some comments in the chat session. Mm -hmm. If we want to read through that, we can definitely do so. But there's um, quite a few people as well who are thanking you for your time today. It's been an awesome workshop. Again, we're still here. Um, if you have any other questions, so please ask them while we still have the session available. But again, Allison did give us um, her email address earlier and presentation, uh, the PDF version will be available after conference ends. Uh, let me read this really quick. Let's see if there's a question mm -hmm. embedded in there or not. Sure. So it's not a question, but um, a comment. And so the comment says, I'm a part of the community health education mm -hmm. worker team at SBCU. SD, and I've noticed that presenting a different face uh, with another set of resources starts to become a gateway to recovering students back to a comfort level with the school. I found that developing CHEW um, or school staff relationships go a long way. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I would agree. It takes a village. It really does, right? You know, we all have a piece and a part. Um, and I think if we can all, again, come together on the why and what we're doing, everybody may have a little bit of a different um, approach. And I think that's the beauty of an interdisciplinary team. Um, and I've always felt like the beauty of that health and education intersection. That was the last comment we have, and I don't see any other questions. So if you have any last words you would like to say, Allison, and before no, we No, I, I, uh, I really, um, I love doing this. I love hearing from people. I, I, you know, um, I love the California School Based Health Alliance. I, I always follow your your website. Um, the, you're doing such great work, and it is such hard work. Um, and I just want to thank all of you for doing what you do and remind you to take care of yourself as well. And I think grounding yourself in that why. And, and remembering it helps us get through some dark days. So I, I wish you uh, peace and keep, keep doing the work.